أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فراغ إلى آلهتهم فقال ألا تأكلون ما لكم لا تنطقون فراغ عليهم ضربا باليمين فأقبلوا إليه يزفون قال أتعبدون ما تنحتون والله خلقكم وما تعملون قالوا بنوا له بنيانا فألقوه في الجحيم فأرادوا به كيدا فجعلناهم الأسفلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, today we're going to discuss some heavy things. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah gives me clarity and speech to be able to communicate these lessons to you. Ibrahim alayhi salam, last, last we talked about, uh, you know, struck with his right hand and destroyed uh, the idols. And they somehow got wind of it. So the part of the story that's been summarized here that was expanded upon elsewhere was, you know, we heard a young man talking about them. Yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. They call him Ibrahim, you know, or he's called Ibrahim. And then they called him and they questioned him. So that's been summarized here. What's been captured here is فَأَقْبَلُوا إِلَيْهِ يَزِفُونَ They came to, running towards him in a hurry. Zaffa is asra'a. Right? So they come, they come panting, running, like stampeding like a mob, heading all towards him. So when they get to him, he's waiting for them. Instead of them questioning him in this passage, he's actually going to question them. And he says these words that have really remarkable echoes. قَالَ أَتَعْبُدُونَ مَا تَنْحِتُونَ Are you going to worship what you carve? So he, he asked this question, are you going to worship what you carve? You see, they're really offended by the, by the destruction of these idols. And obviously they're the ones who carve them. But this question digs a lot deeper. Human beings fall in love with things they build to the point where those things become an object of worship. Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one worthy of our worship. <clears throat> but let me tell you, like, when we say that Allah is our Rabb, then that means no, there's nothing that is loved more than Allah. There's nothing that is obeyed over the obedience to Allah. There's no one that is trusted more than Allah is trusted. There's no one that is, no, no goal is higher than the goal of pleasing, pleasing Allah. So there, there are implications for accepting Allah as my Rabb, as worship, for worshipping Allah. But you know, sometimes somebody's business can become so dear to them that they're thinking about their business when they're awake, they're dreaming about it when they're sleeping, they're talking about their, their business when they're having lunch, they're talking about it when they're on vacation. In fact, they get restless when they're on vacation because they're still thinking about their business. Their business becomes their entire being, right? It defines them, it completely consumes them. And in a psychological sense, it can even become an object of worship. That itself becomes an object of worship. So, yes, human beings can be driven by a goal. An athlete can say, I want to win you know, gold in the Olympics. And they're training hard every single day and they're working towards that goal. And none of that is looked down upon. But there is a psychological limit you know, to, to love of all other things. And above all of them is Allah's love. Above all of them. You know, and if those things, see, you see, this concept is described in Surah Al-Hajj. Allah says, ضعف الطالب والمطلوب The one in pursuit and the thing that is being pursued are both weak. So now listen to those words again. The one in pursuit is the talib. The thing that's being pursued is the matloob, and they are both inherently weak. Uh, and that statement is very powerful. It actually illustrates that I'm only as strong as my pursuit. So, you know, like if you, they interview these famous successful people and they say, well, you know, this, this goal of mine, it keeps me up at night and inspires me, it drives me, this, that, the other, right? So there, there's, there's the winning gold or, you know, winning this championship or making this first million or whatever. There's a business goal, there's an education goal, there's an athletic goal. That's the goal that drives, you know, certain very driven people, 
right? And Allah is saying in this statement, the most driven of us also, the thing, the goal that they're driving towards is weak in and of itself. And they themselves, as a result, are weak. Because you can only be as strong as the thing that you're pursuing. The visual image I want you to keep in your mind is, you know, like mountain climbers, they throw a rope up with a hook, right? And then they, they pull themselves up, right? But if they hooked onto something that is weak, then they've actually put themselves in a position of weakness. You understand? They've become vulnerable. When you, when you cling onto something that is strong, then you become strong. And the, the higher up you throw your hook, that is the, the height that you can reach. You can't reach any further than that, you understand? So, like, the, the, the concept here, the first concept here that I want to illustrate is that we can have very strong goals in life. Like, I can have business goals, career goals, I can have financial goals, I can have family goals, I can have, you know, some, some woman says, by the time I'm this, this age, I should have graduated college. And when I'm this age, I'll be married. And when I'm this age, I'll have a baby. And by this age, I'll have another couple of babies. Inshallah, they'll be twins. And by this age, I'll be done with Hajj. And by this age, she's got a, her whole like, you know, age standards laid out, right? And then one thing doesn't happen. Then another doesn't happen. Then another doesn't happen. Then another doesn't happen. And guess what happens? All hope is lost. All, all, you know, all, all my plans have been ruined. Allah, Allah doesn't want me to be happy. Like you just fall into deep, dire depression. The question I have to ask myself as a man or as a woman is were those goals, those objectives, were they my real object? Really in a sense of worship. Like was that my ultimate goal? If I can't get that, then I can't have contentment. You know, there's, a, there's a depth to the statement, radiallahu anhum wa radu anhum. Allah is pleased with them, they are pleased with Him. Right? Because when Allah, if Allah is pleased with me, and that's enough for me to be pleased with Him, that's it, then everything else that I was going to get some contentment from, some pleasure from, some sense of accomplishment from, those things will come and they will go, but I will still, Allah will still be content with me, and I will still be content with Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? And that, that actually is a powerful remarkable uh, source of strength, our Iman in Allah. Things will come and they will go, and our Iman in Allah will remain. Our contentment with Allah will remain, you know? Life, life goals will come and they will, they, they can, and the, 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 I wanted to first talk to you about this in the context of our own life goals, right? Because Allah doesn't, you know, many of you, you're, you're you know, this is 2022, and obviously we've, we're slowly crawling out of, a, you know, this worldwide COVID situation. But even outside of that, many of you, when you look back at the last five, seven, ten years, you, so many of you look back and say, I never imagined my life would be like this. Like a lot of things I imagined would happen, never happened. Or a lot of the, the terrible things I went through, I never imagined I would go through something like that. Like you look back and you say, wow, it's, it's been pretty messed up. <laughs> you know? And you, you start getting depressed about all the bad things that have happened. And then you start making false projections about the things that are going to happen. Right, but you know what? That all of those bad things that are that are weighing on me or weighing on you, those are actually things we carved ourselves. I'm coming back to the words of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ta'buduna matanhitun. You worship what you carve. Like those people worshipped idols, right? But we carve out goals for ourselves. We carve out an image for ourselves. We carve out, you know, aspirations for ourselves. And when they don't, when they fall apart, then we're up in arms. How can that be? How can that not be? But there's a scarier dimension of that beyond my personal life and something for me to contemplate for myself and you to contemplate for yourselves. But in the, in the religious sphere, in the sphere of servicing Allah's deen, this kind of mentality can even enter the sphere of servicing Allah's deen. Like, you know, imagine, alhamdulillah, we live in a city where there are lots of big masajid and there are places in the world where commun Muslim communities are thriving and people are building and things like that, right? And we're in a position of blessing, right? There are places that are burning to the ground. There are places in the world, masajid are being bulldozed. There are places in the world where people are getting arrested for making salah, right? That's, that's a reality in different parts of the world. And here we are building bigger and bigger masajid and libraries and this and that and the other, right? So th th there's a... There's an enormous blessing, right? But a person becomes blind to those blessings and says, hey, those guys, they raised a lot more for their fundraiser than we raised for our fundraiser. Those people built a much bigger uh, facility. Wait, how many people came to their program? How much? You know, and you know what that is? Well, 
we are we all get together to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we're together. Whether one person worships Allah or a million people worship Allah, it cannot increase the wealth of Allah in any way. He's Al Ghani, right? But you know what? When you start developing this false sense of accomplishment or competition or you know, you get started getting depressed because some other cause that serves Allah is succeeding and it's bothering you that they're succeeding. Well, you know what? Maybe the thing you've carved, that which was supposed to be for the worship of Allah itself has turned into an idol. Scary thought. That that itself, it's so, it, on the label, it's a service to Allah and His deen. But on the inside, it's just projecting your own ego. It's just projecting your own, you know, your own, oh, my community or my, my group or my masjid or my this or my that. They're doing better than everybody else and you're just comparing yourself to others. This is actually a very telling statement that Ibrahim at a young age mentioned to his people when they came angry that it, their idols have been destroyed. Right? So if if you were working, if you were serving Allah's deen, if you, for example, for example, if you became a doctor, let me give you a secular example, I'm not religious. If you became a doctor because you wanted to serve humanity, right? That's why you became a doctor, because you just want to help people. And then you became good at your job, you became head of the hospital, you built your own clinics, you did all this stuff, right? And something happens, some dispute with a partner happens, some legal issue happens, you lose all, you lose your job, you lose all your clinics, you lose everything. You still have your license, you're still a doctor, but all the money and the fame and the prestige and the business and all the social, get, all of that disappeared, right? And now you're all of a sudden in depression, like I lost everything. Well, then you weren't clear by why you became a doctor to be. You came, you became a doctor to help people, right? And you still have the ability to help people. You still have that. So you actually didn't lose anything. And maybe Allah puts people through that so He can make sure they're clear that they're, the original pure intentions they had, maybe they got corrupted along the way. And so what does Allah do sometimes? He rips some of those idols off of you. And if you feel pain for the loss of those idols, it's a good thing because you're being cleansed and then you realize, oh, I was, here, I was doing this for a different reason, right? This is actually similar to what the two gardeners, because this is about shirk. Ibrahim is talking about shirk. And this is what the two gardeners conversation have, uh, is like in Surah Al-Kahf. The gardener that thought that his garden is going to stay here forever because Allah wants him to be happy in both lives. When he loses his garden, Allah takes his garden away. What does he do? He says, Ya laytani lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. If only I didn't do shirk. He, he recognizes something. That garden became an idol for him. That, that, that The wealth, the business, that stuff, that became an object of worship for him without him even realizing it. And then when Allah ripped it away from him, that's when he realized it. So this statement is a very powerful one. Ata'buduna ma tanhitun. Do you worship what, that which you yourselves carve? Are, is that your ultimate objective? Because you know, worship is really what's the, what's the ultimate highest thing in your life? What is the, the highest goal in your life? We, for us, it's Allah. Wa anna ila rabbika al muntaha. So this, this has manifestations within the religious world. It has manifestations in your personal life. It has manifestations in our cultures. Sometimes we, 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 we want to meet certain cultural standards, right? We want our son to be this much, have this much money, or we need to buy a house in this, this neighborhood. Or when we have a wedding for our daughter, it should be in this kind of a hall, and this kind of a, you know, we need to make sure the wedding, the wedding videos look like this, and the flowers look like that, and you know, all of that. And if we don't do any of that, we have failed as a, because that was the ultimate goal. Like nothing was greater than that, you know. And then disobeying Allah along the way to get to that goal, disobey Allah as much as you want, just so we get to that goal. Just so we get to that party, just so we get to have those same you know, videos of people dancing and doing all kinds of stuff at weddings that everybody, you can't even tell whose wedding it is and what's going on. You can't tell the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim wedding. But this is our objective. This is, this is the ultimate success. You know? And so this is a, a, a really powerful look in the mirror that Ibrahim offers to his people. أَتَعْبُدُونَ مَا تَنْحِتُونَ Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma And Allah created you and created all the things that you do. Everything that you've accomplished is also a creation of Allah. And just like you can be taken away at a moment's notice. Alladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. He can take whatever you created away from you also. The thing that is of value is your, your tie to Him. He, he, is He pleased with you? Or are you pleased with Him? That's the only thing that will matter. Everything else is transient. If my entire body, this most valuable asset that I have, if this isn't mine, then why am I so clung, so stuck on all the things that I think I own? 
You know, he says in the beginning of Quran in Baqarah, he says, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ From what we provided them, they give. I don't, you don't give anything. I don't give anything that's mine. He gave it to me and then I give. Like it's not mine to begin with. So he, Ibrahim a.s. calls them out on this and he wants us to internalize it. And you know what they do in response? When they hear that reality check, that reality check offends them so much. Build a monument for him. Build a building just for him. Meaning build a giant fire. We learned before that there's a fire. Now we're learning it's not just a fire. They want to build an entire like pyramid type, whatever structure, and build a giant flame and have a ritual and then burn him. And what does it tell you? It tells you the truth teller the one that speaks this hard truth is going to be uh, you know, the object of a lot of rage in society. Because people that don't want to let go of their gods will hold on to their gods no matter what. They will worship those gods no matter, and they will burn anyone in their path. They will burn them. So they, you know, they, they are ready to burn Ibrahim alayhi salam. فَأَلْقُوهُ فِي الْجَحِيمِ فَأَرَادُوا بِهِ كَيْدًا فَجَعَلْنَاهُمُ الْأَسْفَلِينَ And Allah says they wanted to scheme against him. They, had, they, they intended a scheme against him, but we made them the lowest of the low. Al-Asfalin. We made them the lowest. And this is perhaps Allah alluding to the next life. You know, safilin, like he says elsewhere. So here in these ayat, notice that he used the word Al-Jahim. And Al-Jahim is one of the names of hellfire. And this is the, the, the nature of a materialist who thinks there's no other life than this. To them, the worst thing that can happen is somebody being burned or being killed in this life, that's the, first, the worst that can happen is in this life. The best of it is in this life, the worst of it is in this life. There is no concept of the next life. That's why even a fire here, when it's big enough, they can call it what? Al-Jahim. Al-Jahim is for the next life, it's not for this life. You know? And by, by the way, it comes from Juhum, which is the, 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 the stare of a predatorial animal like a lion, before it you know, pounces, when it looks at its prey and it's about to kill, its pupils dilate and that paralyzing look in the eye of the predator, that's actually called juhum. And from it you get jahim, meaning a, a flame that roars, a flame that has a pounce, a flame that is paralyzingly terrifying. That's actually what's called a jahim. So they wanted to create an example out of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They wanted to show that this, th this kind of thing will not be tolerated and we will celebrate our false gods and show them their true respect by, by making that entire festival out of burning him alive. They wanted to actually create an entire ritual out of burning him alive. Because it's not just, oh, just kill him. No, build a giant fire. They're, they're going to actually get together and this is a whole project of destruction, you know, for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So they intended all of this and Allah made them the lowest. And all Ibrahim alayhi salam says after surviving this fire, when it becomes cool, he says, Qala inni dahibun ila rabbi sayahdini. I am heading to my master. He will guide me soon. What powerful words. If, like, if there are a few words that you should really cling on to from the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, this ayah would be one of them. Surah Al-Safat, ayah number 99. I am heading to my master. I am going to my master. He will guide me. You know what that means? That means it doesn't matter where I go, what I leave behind. And I'm not concerned about what I leave behind. I'm concerned about where I'm heading. He's leaving behind family, friends, safety, society. He's leaving everything behind. But he's not thinking about what he's leaving behind. Other places in Quran, he, Allah highlights what he's leaving behind. Here, it's not just what you're leaving from, it's what you're going to. He says, I'm going to my master. Rabbi. The rest is up to him. Sayyidini, he will guide me. He will guide I, if, if I'm doing right by him, and this is... One of the hardest, toughest questions that a human being likes to avoid deep inside themselves. This is an introspection dars. This is about me looking inside myself. I can give you this talk, but I have to, at the end of this talk or during this talk or before this talk, I have to look inside myself. You have to look inside yourself. Only you can answer this question for yourself. There are things inside me that I know, and there are things inside you that only you know that keep you from going towards your Rabb. There are things you know you shouldn't be doing there are things you know you should be doing. There are things you know that you need to make changes in and you're, you're refusing, you're avoiding it. You're avoiding that conversation even with yourself, right? And when you verbalize this, what do you verbalize? I am going to my master. I'm going to overcome my reluctance. I'm going to overcome my, hesitate, my internal hesitation. 
I'm going to overcome my fear. I'm going to overcome, even if for somebody who's suffering from it, I'm going to overcome my addiction. I'm going to overcome, you know, what, whatever, you know, blocks there are inside of me. I'm just going to say these words. Inni dhahibun ila rabbi. I am going to my master. I'm going to step over all of those things that are in my heart that are keeping me from obeying Allah. And when I do that, what am I going to do if I take that step? What's going to happen? I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. Well, maybe you're not strong enough. Maybe you need someone to hold your hand and take you. And that's actually why the next words are so important. Say, Yahdini, he will guide me. He will take me there. I just have to, you know, take that step and he'll take, he'll do the rest. And when you and I take that step, what's the next most important thing? First, we turn to Allah and ask for his guidance. And then what do we do? We do what Ibrahim alayhi salam does. Rabbi Habli min salihin Master, give me the gift from among righteous people. Meaning, give me the gift of righteous people. Give me good people in my life. And this is actually implicitly saying, give me good children. But it's not just reduced to good children. Because the, the word for children was omitted. It's just habli min salihin Give me the gift of good children. Right? That's all it's, all it's said. It's not, Rabbi habli dhurriyatan min salihin Give me children among the righteous. Or children that have righteousness. Right? Or dhurriyatan saliha. But here, what, what, did, what are we asking Allah for? When you and I decide to take a step towards Allah, then... We beg Allah to put people in our life, to bring people in our life that will help us keep going in the right direction. Because you and I both know there, it's easy to find people in your life that will pull you into the wrong direction. It's easy to just be caught up in a company that will take you away. Like it's the, you know, it's not dhahibun ila rabbi, dhahibun an rabbi. It's going away from my rabb. You know, there are people that will take you away from Allah. And we really want to be around people that are inherently good, and that's a gift from Allah. Now we're learning in this ayah that Ibrahim alayhi salam recognizes that people are a gift from Allah. Good people are a gift from Allah. You know, you can earn money, you can get nice car, you can get a nice house. Those are things, those things are actually easier. But good people in your life is way harder. Good people is way, way harder. And it's the the the, the stories of the prophets, particularly his story, is evidence to that. He has to leave. Every human being that he knows, right? Because he can't find good people. He has to, he still have every last one of them. And he says, the only place I can find good people is if they come as a gift from Allah. Rabbi habli bin salihin How did Allah answer this? Because, you know, does that mean you and I have to go into the wilderness to find the gift from Allah? Well, Allah gave it, made it easier for us. He actually took this dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he turned it into the, a formula for the Muslim in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ankabut, for example, which incidentally also mentions Ibrahim alayhi salam and his hijrah. He says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي الصَّالِحِينَ Those who believe and they do good, they do good deeds. We will absolutely infu- inject them into the company of good people. Guaranteed from Allah, if you decide to take a step towards Allah, that Allah will, in fact, guarantee from Himself, bring into your life good people. Now, by the way, that's not a guarantee that He will not bring bad people into your life also. <laughs> you have to have the distinction, right? You, have to, you and I have to have the sense to know which people are a source of goodness for me, which people are a source of taqwa for me, which people are keeping me under Allah's protection, and Allah, under Allah's obedience, and which people... Being around them is getting me closer and closer and making it, making it easier and easier to disobey Allah. It's becoming more and more tempting for me to disobey Allah because of that company. This is a, this is a response I have to have in my, the, the, a thought I have to have in myself. So Rabbi habli min as salihin And then, by the way, he makes this dua. Now listen to this. He makes this dua when he was a young man. When he was, you know, escape, when he escaped from his village, right? And the next ayah says, فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ Then we gave him the good news of a forbearing, sensitive child. But Allah didn't give him that news immediately. He gave him that news way in his 80s. If we go by the Bible age, even the Quran describes it's an old age, right? So he's going to have Ismail alayhi salam, the first child. He's going to have Ismail alayhi salam way down the road in his old age. 
Now, this is a big topic, the sacrifice, which I'm going to be talking to you about tomorrow, inshallah. But I want to introduce some basic preliminary concepts. In this series, I don't want to go into too much detail because I've talked about this stuff in, in a lot of detail before, particularly about the sacrifice. So I want to give you the summarized version. Okay, Those of you that are interested in the detailed discussion on the sacrifice and the, the comparison between the Bible's account and the Qur'an's account and why this is so important, this is a, a subject matter discussed in detail in uh, Ali Imran, in Surah Ali Imran, and also in Surah Al-Baqarah when we get to the, the change of the Qibla passage. But I'll, I'll say a couple of quick things that are, I think, important for you to understand. So in the Christian tradition, they all pretty much hold the view that the son that was to be sacrificed was Isaac. They call him Isaac. We call him Ishaq, alayhi salam, right? And they actually don't consider Ismail, alayhi salam, a son of Ibrahim. They consider him, alaykum as salam wa They consider him, you know, ma'adullah, uh, they consider him an illegitimate child of Abraham. Okay, so they believe that he was the, the, the child of a, a slave. And that's why he's an illegitimate child, so he doesn't actually count as a child. And then later on, they created an entire mythology around that child being cursed, meaning Ismail, Ishmael being cursed. And therefore, his lineage is also cursed. And therefore, anybody who claims to be a prophet from that lineage cannot ever be accepted. And this was their way of making sure that the chosen lineage is Isaac. And so if Isaac is chosen for the sacrifice, then the children of Isaac are blessed, and the children of Isaac, the child of Isaac is Jacob, Jacob has Joseph, and all the Israelite prophets, right? So the Israelite legacy is blessed because Isaac was chosen for the sacrifice. And Ishmael doesn't even count. Now the Bible says, sacrifice your only son. The Bible's wording to this day is what? Sacrifice your only son. But the Bible also describes that Ismail was born before, 14 years before. So how is it the only son? They had to reconcile, right? So they... They're, they reconciled it by doing what? Uh, well, only son means only legitimate son. That was an illegitimate son. So they would rather make a hideous lie against Ibrahim alayhi salam and call Ismail illegitimate than actually acknowledge that the older, the only son was Ismail alayhi salam. There's an entire book dedicated, a remarkable book dedicated to this subject. It's been recently translated and added to in English also. I'll get you the name of the English version um, uh, tomorrow. But the Arabic book is Ar-Ra'i sahih fi man huwa dhabih The correct position in who was to be slaughtered Now what happens, this was the Jewish tradition That wanted to preserve Jewish specialness By saying that Ishaq was the son to be slaughtered Some Muslims, because we borrowed so much from Jewish sources They also, some of Hasirun also held the view that Ishaq is the child being talked about That is to be slaughtered There's a big problem with that though The Bible itself on many occasions is calling Ismail Ibrahim's son not just Ill, not like you know how they say, oh, it doesn't really count as the son. Multiple times he's been called the son. Then the location where the sacrifice should happen is a valley of burnt rock. Listen carefully. The, the, the location of the according to the Bible's details, the, the sacrifice is supposed to happen on in a valley of burnt rock. And even the English account of the Bible, the location is near Moria. Moria. And Hamiduddin Farahi rahimahullah in his book showed the, the Hebrew wording and showed how they took Mura or Marwa and t t turned it into Muria. It's Safa and Marwa and Shifa and Muria is what they turned it into. And then they say there's burnt rock in Jerusalem. There are no burnt rocks in Jerusalem in a barren land. Where's the burnt rock valley with the barren land? That's Makkah. And Ishaq alayhi salam was never in Makkah. Right? So there's ample evidence from actually early Jewish sources also. Even some of their early Jewish scholarship recognized that Ismail was the son to be sacrificed. The, the Quranic evidence points in that direction. And then the you know scholarship, scholarship points in this direction. All three, and Habib Din Farai did a remarkable job compiling all of that. And then this has larger implications because a lot of what was said by the Jews was then taken up by evangelical Christians. And then in, in the Christian rhetoric, a lot of their rhetoric, you know what they say? Oh, Islam is from the line of Ishmael. And Ishmael, you know, he was a cursed child. So Islam is the religion of the devil. So all of this from where? They started it from where? From which child is to be sacrificed? Now Muslims have a very different view of this. Regardless, even though we know it was Ismail alayhi salam which was to be sacrificed, that doesn't take anything away from the honor of Ishaq. Like that, for us, 
the, you know, the, if Allah has chosen to favor someone in with, with a favor or test someone with a test, that does not take away the honor of someone else. And we don't have the concept of a cursed lineage or a blessed lineage. We don't have that concept. We're all children of Adam a.s. Any human being that makes tawbah has made tawbah. You can't say, oh no, but you're from cursed genetics. You can't make tawbah. Jannah is not for you. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're black, blacklisted. We, we don't have this concept. They do. They actually have the concept of cursed lineages. And theologically, they do, you know, it's an extension of even Adam a.s. You know, his children are cursed because the coming on the earth is cursed. You know, and then the few people get blessed, but everybody else remains cursed. And that's why this entire you know, narrative of Jews versus Gentiles and all of that. But the Qur'an smashed all of it. Every human being is a child of Adam. Every human being has been honored. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ So this sacrifice story actually has major ramifications in even how religions around the world, like Jewish and Christian religions and their new manifestations, and a lot of the political narratives, right? A lot of the politics that is in, injected into religion, a lot of it comes from this narrative. Right, so if you don't understand this story properly from the Quranic perspective, and it gives you, it, it, for those of you that have interactions with Jewish and Christian friends, this is actually a really interesting topic to discuss with them, to bring out the biblical evidences, which is why, inshallah, I'll share the, the, the reference to the book uh, with you. It's uh, been translated into English, and I think PDFs are available online that you can download. If you're interested, you can read up on it yourselves. That has major, major ramifications. And of course, Look at it from a historical point of view. The Arabs, they don't know, you know, لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنْذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ The Arabs of, of Mecca, the Quraysh, they haven't had a prophet for thousands of years. Right? And we, I, when I told you the genealogy, Hud alayhi salam and Salih alayhi salam are before Ibrahim. And Shu'ib alayhi salam is just a little bit after. Right? So they're, this has been thousands of years they've had no prophets. Right? Why are they... Sacrificing an animal in the name of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam, but even before Islam, there's a practice that existed for centuries and centuries and centuries. Where did they get it from? Why, why are they doing it right, right there? You see, why are they celebrating Safa and Marwa? A lot of what we learn in the Quran, the pagan version of that was already there. The Quran restored the original story, right? But there's no anthropological reason for them to have even the name Ibrahim alayhi salam unless he was there. So there's actually some really interesting historical study associated with this, this concept. And it, it's a very interesting point to discuss with the people of the book. Respectfully, but still discuss with the people of the book. So they see our point of view on this remarkable story. And by the way, Ibrahim salam just said, why do you worship that which you carve, remember? And then quickly Allah moves to, he gave him a child. And as, as soon as he gave... Gives him a child, he says, and when this child could be old enough that he could run around with him, Allah, uh, he told his son, I see in my dream that I'm slaughtering you. You see what Allah did? You see what I was telling you before? It's not just idols that we carve. It's the thing that we put value in in life that becomes an object of worship. And for an old man, what's more valuable than his child? Right? And when he gets to the age where he can run around and see he's turning into a young man, that's when Allah showed him the dream that he's sacrificing his son. You see what Allah did? Like the thing that has most value in your heart, are you ready to give that before Allah Azza wa Jal? He asked much less from us. He's asking us, You're not going to attain any goodness if, unless you spend some of what you love. Not all of what you love. Some of what you love. Mimma tuhibbun. Not tunfiqu ma tuhibbun, tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. That's a mercy from Allah. Allah didn't expect us to say, Sacrifice everything you love, and that's why how I'll know you love me, or you'll be good. No, sacrifice out of so, some of the things that you love, give, give them up. Out of some of them, give them up. And that's a mercy that Allah gave to us, uh, and ease that Allah gave to us. So with this background in mind, inshallah, we'll delve into the sacrifice story. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.